The Torrents of Spring, a romantic novel in honor of the passing of a great race. And perhaps there is one reason why a comic writer should of all others be the least excused for deviating from nature, since it may not always be easy for a serious poet to meet with the great and the admirable. But life everywhere furnishes an accurate observer with the ridiculous. Henry Fielding Part 1 Red and Black Laughter Chapters 1 through 5 The only source of the true ridiculous, as it appears to me, is affectation. Henry Fielding Chapter 1 Yogi Johnson stood looking out of the window of the big pump factory in Michigan. Spring would soon be here. Could it be that that was what this writing fellow Hutchinson had said? If winter comes, can spring be far behind? Would it be true again this year? Yogi Johnson wondered. Near Yogi, at the next window but one, stood Scripps O'Neill, a tall, lean man with a tall, lean face. Both stood and looked out at the empty yard of the pump factory. Snow covered the crated pumps that would soon be shipped away. Once the spring should come and the snow melt, workmen from the factory would break out the pumps from piles where they were snowed in and haul them down to the G.R. and I. station, where they would be loaded on flat cars and shipped away. Yogi Johnson looked out of the window at the snowed-in pumps, and his breath made little fairy tracings on the cold window pane. Yogi Johnson thought of Paris. Perhaps it was the little fairy tracings that reminded him of the gay city where he had once spent two weeks, two weeks that were to have been the happiest weeks of his life. That was all behind him now, that and everything else. Scripps O'Neill had two wives. As he looked out of the window, standing tall and lean and resilient with his own tenuous hardness, he thought of both of them. One lived in Mansalona and the other lived in Petoskey. He had not seen the wife who lived in Monsalona since last spring. He looked out at the snow-covered pump yards and thought what spring would mean. With his wife in Monsalona, Scripps often got drunk. When he was drunk, he and his wife were happy. They would go down together to the railway station and walk out along the tracks, and then sit together and drink and watch the trains go by. They would sit under a pine tree on a little hill that overlooked the railway and drink. Sometimes they drank all night. Sometimes they drank for a week at a time. It did them good. It made Scribs strong. Scribs had a daughter whom he playfully called Lousy O'Neill. Her real name was Lucy O'Neill. One night after Scribs and his old woman had been out drinking on the railroad line for three or four days, he lost his wife. He didn't know where she was. When he came to himself, everything was dark. He walked along the railroad track toward town. The ties were stiff and hard under his feet. He tried walking on the rails. He couldn't do it. He had the dope on that all right. He went back to walking along the ties. It was a long way into town. Finally came to where he could see the lights of the switchyard. He cut away from the tracks and passed the Monsalona High School. It was a yellow brick building. There was nothing rococo about it, like the buildings he had seen in Paris. No, he had never been in Paris. That was not he. That was his friend, Yogi Johnson. Yogi Johnson looked out of the window. Soon it would be time to shut the pump factory for the night. He opened the window carefully, just to crack, but that was enough. Outside in the yard, the snow had begun to melt. A warm breeze was blowing. A Chinook wind, the pump fellows called it. The warm Chinook wind came in through the window into the pump factory. All the workmen laid down their tools. Many of them were Indians. The foreman was a short, iron-jawed man. He had once made a trip as far as Duluth. Duluth was far across the blue waters of the lake in the hills of Minnesota. A wonderful thing had happened to him there. The foreman put his finger in his mouth to moisten it and held it up in the air. He felt the warm breeze on his finger. He shook his head ruefully and smiled at the men, a little grimly, perhaps. Well, it's a regular Chinook, boys, he said. Silently, for the most part, the workmen hung up their tools. The half-completed pumps were put away in their racks. 
the workmen filed, some of them talking, others silent, a few muttering to the washroom to wash up. Outside through the window came the sound of an Indian war hoop. Chapter 2 Scripps O'Neill stood outside the Mancelona High School, looking up at the lighted windows. It was dark, and the snow was falling. It had been falling ever since Scripps could remember. The passerby stopped and stared at Scripps. After all, what was this man to him? He went on. Scripps stood in the snow and stared up at the lighted windows of the high school. Inside there, people were learning things. Far into the night they worked the boys vying with the girls in their search for knowledge, this urge for the yearning of things that was sweeping America. His girl, Little Lousy, a girl that had cost him a cool seventy-five dollars in doctor's bills, was in there learning. Scripps was proud. It was too late for him to learn, but there, day after day and night after night, Lousy was learning. She had the stuff in her, that girl. Scripps went on up to the house, it was not a big house, but it wasn't size that mattered to Scripps' old woman. Scripps, she often had said when they were drinking together, I don't want a palace, all I want is a place to keep the wind out. Scripps had taken her at her word. Now, as he walked in the late evening through the snow and saw the lights of his own home, he felt glad that he had taken her at her word. It was better this way than if they were coming home to a palace. He, Scripps, was not the sort of chap that wanted a palace. He opened the door of his house and went in. Something kept going through his head. He tried to get it out, but it was no good. What was it that poet chap his friend Harry Parker had met once in Detroit had written? Harry used to recite it. Through pleasures and palaces, though I may roam, when you something, 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 there's no place like home. He could not remember the words, not all of them. He had written a simple tune to it and taught Lucy to sing it. That was when they first were married. Scripps might have been a composer, one of these chaps that write the stuff the Chicago Symphony Orchestra plays, if he had had a chance to go on. He would get Lucy to sing that song tonight. He would never drink again. Drinking robbed him of his ear for music. Times when he was drunk, the sound of the whistles of the trains at night, pulling up the Boyne Falls grade seemed more lovely than anything this chap Stravinsky had ever written. Drinking had done that. It was wrong. He would get away to Paris like this chap Albert Spaulding that played the violin. Scripps opened the door. He went in. Lucy, he called. It is I, Scripps. He would never drink again. No more nights out on the railroad. Perhaps Lucy needed a new fur coat. Perhaps, after all, she had wanted a palace instead of this place. You never knew how you were treating a woman. Perhaps, after all, this place was not keeping out the wind. Fantastic. He lit a match. Lucy, he called, and there was a note of dumb terror in his mouth. His friend Walt Simmons had heard just such a cry from a stallion that had once been run over by a passing autobus in the Place Vendôme in Paris. In Paris there were no geldings. All the horses were stallions. They did not breed mares. Not since the war. The war changed all that. Lucy, he called, and again, Lucy. There was no answer. The house was empty. Through the snow-filled air, as he stood there alone in his tall leanness, in his own deserted house, there came to Scripps ears the distant sound of an Indian war hoop. Chapter 3 Scripps left Monsalona. He was through with that place. What had a town like that to give him? There was nothing to it. You worked all your life, and then a thing like that happened. The savings of years wiped out. Everything gone. He started to Chicago to get a job. Chicago was the place. Look at its geographical situation, right at the end of Lake Michigan. Chicago would do big things. Any fool could see that. He would buy land in what is now the Loop, the big shopping and manufacturing district. He would buy the land at a low price and then hang on to it. Let them try and get it away from him. He knew a thing or two now. Alone, bareheaded, the snow blowing in his hair, he walked down the G.R. and I. railway tracks. It was the coldest night he had ever known. He picked up a dead bird that had frozen and fallen onto the railroad tracks and put it inside his shirt to warm it. The bird nestled close to his warm body and pecked at his chest gratefully. 
Poor little chap, Scripps said. You feel the cold, too. Tears came into his eyes. Drat that wind, Scripps said, and once again faced into the blowing snow. The wind was blowing straight down from Lake Superior. The telegraph wires above Scripps' head sang in the wind. Through the dark, Scripps saw a great yellow eye coming toward him. The giant locomotive came nearer through the snowstorm. Scripps stepped to one side of the track to let it go by. What is it that old writing fellow Shakespeare says? Might makes right? Scripps thought of that quotation as the train went past him in the snowing darkness. First the engine passed. He saw the fireman bending to fling great shovelfuls of coal into the open furnace door. The engineer wore goggles. His face was lit up by the light from the open door of the engine. He was the engineer. It was he who had his hand on the throttle. Scripps thought of the Chicago anarchist who, when they were hanged, said, Though you throttle us today, still you cannot something something our souls. There was a monument where they were buried in Waldheim Cemetery, right beside the Forest Park Amusement Park in Chicago. His father used to take Scripps out there on Sundays. The monument was all black, and there was a black angel. That was when Scripps had been a little boy. He used often to ask his father, Father, why, if we came to look at the anarchists on Sunday, why can't we ride on the shoot the chutes? He had never been satisfied with his father's answer. He had been a little boy in knee pants then. His father had been a great composer. His mother was an Italian woman from the north of Italy. They are strange people, these North Italians. Scripps stood beside the track, and the long black segments of the train clicked by him in the snow. All the cars were Pullmans. The blinds were down. Light came in thin slits from the bottom of the dark windows as the cars went by. The train did not roar by as it might have if it had been going in the other direction because it was climbing the Boyne Falls grade. It went slower than if it had been going down. Still, it went too fast for Scripps to hitch on. He thought how he had been an expert at hitching on grocery wagons when he was a young boy in knee pants. The long black train of Pullman cars passed Scripps as he stood beside the tracks. Who were in these cars? Were they Americans piling up money while they slept? Were they mothers? Were they fathers? Were there lovers among them? Or were they Europeans, members of a worn-out civilization, world-weary from the war? Scripps wondered. The last car passed him, and the train went on up the track. Scripps watched the red light at its stern, disappearing into the blackness through which the snowflakes now came softly. The bird fluttered inside his shirt. Scripps started along the ties. He wanted to get to Chicago that night, if possible, to start work in the morning. The bird fluttered again. It was not so feeble now. Scripps put his hand on it to still its little bird flutterings. The bird was calmed. Scripps strode on up the track. After all, he did not need to go as far as Chicago. There were other places. What if that critic fellow Henry Mencken had called Chicago the literary capital of America? There was Grand Rapids. Once in Grand Rapids, he could start in on the furniture business, Fortunes had been made that way. Grand Rapids furniture was famous wherever young couples walked in the evening to talk of homemaking. He remembered a sign he had seen in Chicago as a little boy. His mother had pointed it out to him as together they walked barefoot through what now is probably the loop, begging from door to door. His mother loved the bright flashing of the electric lights and the sign. They are like San Miniato in my native Florence, she told Scripps. Look at them, my son, she said, for some day your music will be played there by the Firenze Symphony Orchestra. Scripps had often watched the sign for hours while his mother slept, wrapped in an old shawl on what is now probably the Blackstone Hotel. The sign had made a great impression on him. Let Hartman feather your nest, it had said. It flashed in many different colors, first a pure, dazzling white. That was what Scripps loved best. Then it flashed a lovely green, then it flashed red. One night, as he lay crouched against his mother's body warmth and watched the sign flash, a policeman came up. You'll have to move along, he said. Ah, yes, there was big money to be made in the furniture business if you knew how to go about it. He, Scripps, knew all the wrinkles of that game. In his own mind it was settled. 
He would stop at Grand Rapids. The little bird fluttered, happily now. Ah, what a beautiful gilded cage I'll build for you, my pretty one, Scripps said exultantly. The little bird pecked at him confidently. Scripps strode on in the storm. The snow was beginning to drift across the track. Born on the wind, there came to Scripps' ears the sound of a far-off Indian war hoop. Chapter 4 Where was Scripps now? Walking in the night and the storm, he had become confused. He had started for Chicago after that dreadful night when he had found that his home was a home no longer. Why had Lucy left? What had become of Lousy? He, Scripps, did not know. Not that he cared, that was all behind him. There was none of that now. He was standing knee-deep in snow in front of a railway station. On the railway station was written in big letters, Petoskey. There were a pile of deer shipped down by hunters from the upper peninsula of Michigan, lying piled the one on the other, dead and stiff, and drifted half over with snow on the station platform. Scripps read the sign again. Could this be Petoskey? A man was inside the station, tapping something back of a wicket at window. He looked out at Scripps. Could he be a telegrapher? Something told Scripps that he was. He stepped out of the snowdrift and approached the window. Behind the window, the man worked busily away at his telegrapher's key. "'Are you a telegrapher?' asked Scripps. "'Yes, sir,' said the man. "'I'm a telegrapher.' "'How wonderful!' The telegrapher eyed him suspiciously. After all, what was this man to him? "'Is it hard to be a telegrapher?' Scripps asked. He wanted to ask the man outright if this was Petoskey. He did not know this great northern section of America, though, and he wished to be polite. The telegrapher looked at him curiously. Say, he asked, are you a fairy? No, Scripps said, I don't know what being a fairy means. Well, said the telegrapher, what do you carry a bird around for? Bird, asked Scripps, what bird? That bird that's sticking out of your shirt. Scripps was at a loss. What sort of chap was this telegrapher? What sort of men went in for telegraphy? Were they like composers? Were they like artists? Were they like writers? Were they like the advertising men who write the ads in our national weeklies? Or were they like Europeans, drawn and wasted by the war, their best years behind them? Could he tell this telegrapher the whole story? Would he understand? I started home, he began. I passed the Mancelona High School. I knew a girl in Mancelona, the telegrapher said. Maybe you knew her. Ethel Enright? was no good going on. He would cut the story short. He would give the bare essentials. Besides, it was beastly cold. It was cold standing there on the windswept station platform. Something told him it was useless to go on. He looked over at the deer lying there in a pile, stiff and cold. Perhaps they too had been lovers. Some were bucks and some were does. The bucks had horns. That was how you could tell. With cats, it is more difficult. In France, they gelt the cats and do not gelt the horses. France was a long way off. My wife left me, Scripps said abruptly. I don't wonder if you go around with the damn bird sticking out of your shirt, the telegrapher said. What town is this, Scripps asked. The single moment of spiritual communion they had 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 been dissipated. They had never really had it, but they might have. It was no use now. It was no use trying to capture what had gone, what had fled. Petoskey, the telegrapher, replied. Thank you, Scripps said. He turned and walked into the silent, deserted northern town. Luckily, he had $450 in his pocket. He had sold a story to George Horace Lorimer just before he had started out with his old woman on the drinking trip. Why had he gone at all? What was it all about, anyway? Coming toward him down the street came two Indians. They looked at him, but their faces did not change. Their faces remained the same. They went into McCarthy's barber shop. Chapter 5 Scripps O'Neill stood irresolutely before the barber shop. Inside there, men were being shaved. Other men, no different, were having their hair cut. Other men sat against the wall in tall chairs and smoked, waiting their turn in the barber chairs admiring the paintings hung on the wall, or admiring their own reflections in the long mirror. Should he, Scripps, go in there? After all, he 
had four hundred and fifty dollars in his pocket. He could go where he wanted. He looked once again irresolutely. It was an inviting prospect. The society of men, the warm room, the white jackets of the barbers skillfully snipping away with their scissors or drawing their blades diagonally through the lather that covered the face of some man who was getting a shave. They could use their tools, these barbers. Somehow it wasn't what he wanted. He wanted something different. He wanted to eat. Besides, there was his bird to look after. Scripps O'Neill turned his back on the barber shop and strode away up on the street of the silently frozen northern town. On his right, as he walked, the weeping birches, their branches bare of leaves, hung down to the ground, heavy with snow. To his ears came the sound of sleigh bells. Perhaps it was Christmas. In the south, little children would be shooting off firecrackers and crying, Christmas gift, Christmas gift, to one another. His father came from the south. He had been a soldier in the rebel army, way back in Civil War days. Sherman had burned their house down on his march to the sea. War is hell, Sherman had said, but you see how it is, Mrs. O'Neill, I've got to do it. He had touched a match to the white pillared old house. If General O'Neill were here, you dastard, his mother had said, speaking in her broken English, you'd never have touched a match to that house. Smoke curled up from the old house. The fire was mounting. The white pillars were obscured in the rising smoke wreaths. Scripps had held close to his mother's linsey woolsey dress. General Sherman climbed back onto his horse and made a low bow. Mrs. O'Neill, he said, and Scripps' mother always said there were tears in his eyes, even if he was a damned yank. The man had a heart, sir, even if he did not follow its dictates. Mrs. O'Neill, if the general were here, we could have it out as man to man. As it is, ma'am, war being what it is, I must burn your house. He motioned to one of his soldiers, who ran forward and threw a bucket of kerosene on the flames. The flames rose, and a great column of smoke went up in the still evening air. At least, General Sherman, Scripps' mother, said triumphantly, that column of smoke will warn the other loyal daughters of the Confederacy that you are coming. Sherman bowed. That is the risk we must take, ma'am. He clapped spurs to his horse and rode away, his long white hair floating on the wind. Neither Scripps nor his mother ever saw him again. Odd that he should think of that incident now. He looked up. Facing him was a sign. Brown's Beanery, the best by test. He would go in and eat. This was what he wanted. He would go in and eat. That sign, the best by test. Ah, these big beanery owners were wise fellows. They knew how to get the customers. No ads in the Saturday evening post for them. The Best Buy test, that was the stuff. He went in. Inside the door of the beanery, Scripps O'Neill looked around him. There was a long counter. There was a clock. There was a door led into the kitchen. There were a couple of tables. There were a pile of donuts under a glass cover. There were signs put out, on the wall, advertising things one might eat. Was this, after all, Brown's Beanery? I wonder, Scripps asked an elderly waitress who came in through the swinging door from the kitchen, if you could tell me if this is Brown's Beanery. Yes, sir, answered the waitress. The best by test. Thank you, Scripps said. He sat down at the counter. I would like to have some beans for myself and some for my bird here. He opened his shirt and placed the bird on the counter. The bird ruffled his feathers and shook himself. He pecked inquiringly at the ketchup bottle. The elderly waitress put out a hand and stroked him. Isn't he a manly little fellow, she remarked. By the way, she asked, a little shamefacedly, what was it you ordered, sir? Beans, Scripps said, for my bird and myself. The waitress shoved up a little wicket that led into the kitchen. Scripps had a glimpse of a warm, steam-filled room with big pots and kettles and many shining cans on the wall. A pig and the noisy ones, the waitress called in a matter-of-fact voice into the open wicket. One for a bird. On the fire, a voice answered from the kitchen. How old is your bird? the elderly waitress asked. I don't know, Scripps said. I never saw him before last night. I was walking on the railroad track from Mancelona. My wife left me. Poor little chap, the waitress said. She poured a little ketchup on her finger, and the bird pecked at it gratefully. My wife left me, Scripps said, 
We'd been out drinking on the railroad track. We used to go out evenings and watch the trains pass. I write stories. I had a story in the post and two in the dial. Menken's trying to get a hold of me. Too wise for that sort of thing. No polizzi for me. They give me the cats and jammers. What was he saying? He was talking wildly. That would never do. He must pull himself together. Schofield Thayer was my best man, he said, and I'm a Harvard man. All I want is for them to give me and my bird a square deal. No more wealth politique. Take Dr. Coolidge away. His mind was wandering. He knew what it was. He was faint with hunger. This northern air was too sharp, too keen for him. I say, he said, could you let me have just a few of those beans? I don't like to rush things. I know when to let well enough alone. The wicket came up, and a large plate of beans and a small plate of beans, both steaming, appeared. Here they are, the waitress said. Scripps fell, too, on the large plate of beans. There was a little pork, too. The bird was eating happily, raising its head after each swallow to let the beans go down. He does that to thank God for those beans, the elderly waitress explained. They're mighty fine beans, too, Scripps agreed. Under the influence of the beans, his head was clearing. What was this rot he had been talking about, that man Henry Mencken? Was Mencken really after him? Wasn't a pretty prospect face. He had four hundred and fifty dollars in his pocket. When that was gone, he could always put an end to things. They pressed him too far, they would get a big surprise. He wasn't the man to be taken alive. Just let them try it. After eating his beans, the bird had fallen asleep. He was sleepy on one leg, the other leg tucked up into his feathers. When he gets tired of sleepy on that leg, he will change legs and rest, the waitress remarked. We had an old osprey at home that was like that. Where was your home, Scripps asked. In England, in the Lake District. The waitress smiled a bit wistfully. Wordsworth's country, you know. Ah, these English. They traveled all over the face of the globe. They were not content to remain in their little island. Strange Nordics, obsessed with their dream of empire. I was not always a waitress, the elderly waitress remarked. Sure you weren't. Not half, the waitress went on. It's rather a strange story. Perhaps it would bore you? Not at all, Scripps said. You wouldn't mind if I used the story sometime? Not if you find it interesting. The waitress smiled. You wouldn't use my name, of course. Not if you'd rather not, Scripps said. By the way, could I have another order of beans? Best by test, the waitress smiled. Her face was lined in gray. She looks a little like that actress that died in Pittsburgh. What was her name? Lenore Ulrich. And Peter Pan. That was it. They say she always went about veiled, Scripps thought. There was an interesting woman. Was it Lenore Ulrich? Perhaps not. No matter. You really want some more beans? asked the waitress. Yes, Scripps answered simply. Once again on the loud ones, the waitress called into the wicket. Lay off the bird. On the fire came the response. Please go on with your story, Scripps said kindly. It was the year of the Paris Exposition, she began. I was a young girl at the time, a jeune fille, and I came over from England with my mother. We were going to be present at the opening of the exposition. On our way from the Gare de Nord, to the hotel in the Place Vendôme, where we lodged, we stopped at a coiffure's shop and made some trifling purchase. My mother, as I recall, purchased an additional bottle of smelling salts, as you call them here in America. She smiled. Yes, go on. Smelling salts, Scripps said. We registered, as is customary in the hotel, and were given the adjoining rooms we had reserved. My mother felt a bit done in by the trip, and we dined in our rooms. I was full of excitement about seeing the exposition on the morrow, but I was tired after the journey. We had a rather nasty crossing, and slept soundly. In the morning I woke and called for my mother. There was no answer, and I went into the room to waken Mummy. Instead of Mummy, there was a French general in the bed. Mandou, Scripps said. I was terribly frightened, the waitress went on, and rang the bell for the management. The concierge came up, and I demanded to know where my mother was. But, mademoiselle, the concierge explained, we know nothing about your mother. You came here with General so-and-so. I cannot remember the general's name. 
Call him General Joffre, Scripps suggested. It was a name very like that, the waitress said. I was fearfully frightened and sent for the police and demanded to see the guest register. You'll find there that I am registered with my mother, I said. The police came and the concierge brought up the register. See, si, madame, he said, you are registered with the general with whom you came to our hotel last night. I was desperate. Finally, I remembered where the coiffure shop was. The police sent for the coiffure. An agent of police brought him in. I stopped at your shop with my mother, I said to the coiffure, and my mother bought a bottle of aromatic salts. I remember mademoiselle perfectly, the coiffure said, but you were not with your mother. You were with an elderly French general. He purchased, I believe, a pair of mustache tongs. My books, at any rate, will show the purchase. I was in despair. In the meantime, the police had brought in the cab driver who had brought us from the gare to the hotel. He swore that I had never been with my mother. Tell me, does this story bore you? Go on, said Scripps, if you had ever been as hard up for plots as I have been. Well, the waitress said, that's all there is to the tale. I never saw my mother again. I communicated with the embassy, but they could do nothing. It was finally established by them that I had crossed the channel with my mother, but they could do nothing beyond that. Tears came into the elderly waitress's eyes. I never saw Mummy again. Never again. Not even once. What about the general? He finally loaned me one hundred francs. Not a great sum, even in those days. And I came to America and became a waitress. That's all there is to the story. There's more than that, Scripps said. I'd stake my life there's more than that. Sometimes, you know, I feel there is, the waitress said. I feel there must be more than that. Somewhere, somehow, there must be an explanation. I don't know what brought the subject into my mind this morning. It was a good thing to get it off your mind, Scripps said. Yes, the waitress smiled, the lines in her face not quite so deep now. I feel better now. Tell me, Scripps asked the waitress, is there any work in this town for me and my bird? Honest work, asked the waitress. I only know of honest work. Yes, honest work, Scripps said. They do say they're hiring hands at the new pump factory, the waitress said. Why shouldn't he work with his hands? Rodin had done it. Cezanne had been a butcher. Renoir a carpenter. Picasso had worked in a cigarette factory in his boyhood. Gilbert Stewart, who painted those famous portraits of Washington that are reproduced all over this America of ours and hang in every schoolroom, Gilbert Stewart had been a blacksmith. Then there was Emerson. Emerson had been a hod carrier. James Russell Lowell had been, he had heard, telegraph operator in his youth, like that chap down at the station. Perhaps even now that telegrapher at the station was working on his thanatopsis or his Tua waterfowl. Why shouldn't he, Scripps O'Neill, work in a pump factory? You'll come back again, the waitress said. If I may, Scripps said, and bring your bird. Yes, Scripps said, the little chap's rather tired now. After all, it was a hard night for him. I should say it was, agreed the waitress. Scripps went out again into the town. He felt clear-headed and ready to face life. A pump factory would be interesting. Pumps were big things now. Fortunes were made and lost in pumps every day in New York and Wall Street. He knew of a chap who'd cleaned up a cool half million on pumps in less than half an hour. They knew what they were about, these big Wall Street operators. Outside on the street, he looked up at the sign. Best by test, he read. They had the dope all right, he said. Was it true, though, that there had been a Negro cook? Just once, just for one moment, when the wicket went up, he thought he had caught a glimpse of something black. Perhaps the chap was only... Part 2. The Struggle for Life Chapters 6 through 10 And here I solemnly protest I have no intention to vilify or disperse anyone. For though everything is copied from the book of nature, and scarce a character or action produce which I have not taken from my own observations or experience, yet I have used the utmost care to obscure the persons by such different circumstances, degrees, and colors, that it will be impossible to guess at them with any degree of certainty. And if it ever happens otherwise, 
it is only where the failure characterized is so minute that it is a foible only which the party himself may laugh at, as well as any other. Henry Fielding Chapter 6 Scripps O'Neill was looking for employment. It would be good to work with his hands. He walked down the street away from the beanery and past McCarthy's barber shop. He did not go into the barber shop. It looked as inviting as ever, but it was employment Scripps wanted. He turned sharply around the corner of the barber shop and onto the main street of Petoskey. It was a handsome broad street lined on either side with brick and pressed stone buildings. Scripps walked along it toward the part of town where the pump factory stood. At the door of the pump factory he was embarrassed. Could this really be the pump factory? True, a stream of pumps were being carried out and set up in the snow, and workmen were throwing pails of water over them to encase them in a coating of ice that would protect them from the winter winds as well as any paint would. But were they really pumps? It might all be a trick. These pump men were clever fellows. I say, Scripps beckoned to one of the workmen, who was sloshing water over a new raw-looking pump that had just been carried out and stood protestingly in the snow. Are they pumps? They will be in time, the workman said. Scripps knew it was the factory. They weren't going to fool him on that. He walked up to the door. There was a sign on it. Keep out. This means you. Can that mean me? Scripps wondered. He knocked on the door and went in. I'd like to speak to the manager, he said, standing quietly in the half-light. Workmen were passing him, carrying the new raw pumps on their shoulders. They hummed snatches of songs as they passed. The handles of the pumps flopped stiffly in dumb protest. Some pumps had no handles. They, perhaps, after all, are the lucky ones, Scripps thought. A little man came up to him. He was well-built, short, with wide shoulders and a grim face. You are asking for the manager? Yes, sir. I'm the foreman here. What I say goes. Can you hire and fire? Scripps asked. I can do one as easily as the other, the foreman said. I want a job. Any experience? Not in pumps. All right, the foreman said. We'll put you on piecework. Here, Yogi, he called to one of the men, who was standing looking out of the window at the factory. Show this new chum where to stow his swag and how to find his way around these diggings. The foreman looked Scripps up and down. I'm an Australian, he said. Hope you like the lay here. He walked off. The man called Yogi Johnson came over from the window. Glad to meet you, he said. He was a chunky, well-built fellow, one of the sort you see around almost anywhere. He looked as though he'd been through things. Your foreman's the first Australian I've ever met, Scripps said. Oh, he's not Australian, Yogi said. He was just with the Australians once during the war, and it made a big impression on him. Were you in the war? Scripps asked. Yes, Yogi Johnson said. I was the first man to go from Cadillac. Must have been quite an experience. It's meant a lot to me, Yogi answered. Come on, and I'll show you around the works. Scripps followed this man, who showed him through the pump factory. It was dark but warm inside the pump factory. Men naked to the waist took the pumps in huge tongs as they came trundling by on an endless chain, culling out the misfits and placing the perfect pumps on another endless chain that carried them up into the cooling room. Other men, Indians for the most part, wearing only breech clouts, broke up the misfit pumps with huge hammers and adzits and rapidly recast them into axe heads. Wagon springs, trombone slides, bullet molds, all the byproducts of a big pump factory. There was nothing wasted, Yogi pointed out. A group of Indian boys, humming to themselves one of the old tribal chanties, squatted in a corner of the big forging room, shaping the little fragments that were chipped from the pumps and casting into safety razor blades. They work naked, Yogi said. They're searched as they go out. Sometimes they try and conceal the razor blades and take them out with them to bootleg. There must be quite a loss that way, Scripps said. Oh, no, Yogi answered. The inspectors get most of them. Upstairs, apart in a separate room, two old men were working. Yogi opened the door. One of the old men looked over his steel spectacles and frowned. You make a draft, he said. Shut the door, the other old man said in the high, complaining voice of the very old. 
There are two hand workers, Yogi said. They make all the pumps the manufactory sends out to the big international pump races. Do you remember our peerless pounder that won the pump race in Italy, where Frankie Dawson was killed? I read about it in the paper, Scripps answered. Mr. Barrow over there in the corner made the peerless pounder all himself by hand, Yogi said. I carved it direct from the steel with this knife. Mr. Barrow held up a short bladed, razor like looking knife. Took me eighteen months to get it right. The peerless pounder was quite a pump, all right, the high voiced little old man said. But we're working on one now that will show its heels to any of them foreign pumps, aren't we, Henry? That's Mr. Shaw, Yogi said in an undertone. He's probably the greatest living pump maker. You boys get along and leave us alone, Mr. Barrow said. He was carving away steadily, his infirm old hand shaking a little between strokes. Let the boys watch, Mr. Shaw said. Where are you from, young feller? I've just come from Mancelona, Scripps answered. My wife left me. Well, you won't have no difficulty finding another one, Mr. Shaw said. You're a likely-looking young feller, but take my advice and take your time. A poor wife ain't much better than no wife at all. I wouldn't say that, Henry, Mr. Barrow remarked in his high voice. Any wife at all is a pretty good wife, the way things are going now. You take my advice, young feller. Go slow. Get yourself a good one this time. Henry knows a thing or two, Mr. Barrow said. He knows what he's talking about there. He laughed a high, crackling laugh. Mr. Shaw, the old pump maker, blushed. You boys get a line, leave us, get on with our pump making, he said. Henry and me here, we got a side of work to do. I'm very glad to have met you, Scripps said. Come on, Yogi said. I'd better get you started, or the foreman will be on my tail. He put Scripps to work collaring pistons in the piston collaring room. There, Scripps worked for almost a year. In some ways, it was the happiest year of his life. In other ways, it was a nightmare, a hideous nightmare. In the end, he grew to like it. In other ways, he hated it. Before he knew it, a year had passed. He was still collaring pistons. But what strange things had happened in that year? Often he wondered about them. As he wondered, collaring a piston now almost automatically, he listened to the laughter that came up from below, where the little Indian lads were shaping what were to be razor blades. As he listened, Something rose in his throat and almost choked him. Chapter 7 That night, after his first day in the pump factory, the first day in what was or were to become an endless succession of days of dull piston collaring, Scripps went again to the beanery to eat. All day he had kept his bird concealed. Something told him that the pump factory was not the place to bring his bird out in. During the day the bird had several times made him uncomfortable but he had adjusted his clothes to it, and even cut a little slit the bird could poke his beak out through and search for fresh air. Now the day's work was over. It was finished. Scripps on his way to the beanery. Scripps happy that he was working with his hands. Scripps thinking of the old pump makers. Scripps going to the society of the friendly waitress. Who was that waitress, anyway? What was it had happened to her in Paris? He must find out more about this Paris. Yogi Johnson had been there. He would quiz Yogi, get him to talk, draw him out, make him tell what he knew. He knew a trick or two about that. Watching the sunset out over the Petoskey Harbor, the lake now frozen and great blocks of ice jutting out over the breakwater, Scripps strode down the streets of Petoskey to the beanery. He would have liked to ask Yogi Johnson to eat with him, but he didn't dare. Not yet. That would come later. All in good time. No need to rush matters with a man like Yogi. Who was Yogi, anyway? Had he really been in the war? What had the war meant to him? Was he really the first man to enlist from Cadillac? Where was Cadillac, anyway? Time would tell. Scripps O'Neill opened the door and went into the beanery. The elderly waitress got up from the chair where she had been reading the overseas edition of the Manchester Guardian and put the paper and her steel-rimmed spectacles on top of the cash register. Good evening, she said simply. It's good to have you back. Something stirred inside Scripps O'Neill. A feeling that he could not define came within him. I've been working all day long. He looked at the elderly waitress. For you, he added. How lovely, she said, and then smiled shyly. 
and I have been working all day long for you. Tears came into Scripps' eyes. Something stirred inside him again. He reached forward to take the elderly waitress's hand, and with quiet dignity she laid it within his own. You are my woman, he said. Tears came into her eyes, too. You are my man, she said. Once again, I say, you are my woman. Scripps pronounced the words solemnly. Something had broken inside him again. He felt he could not keep from crying. Let this be our wedding ceremony, the elderly waitress said. Scripps pressed her hand. You are my woman, he said simply. You are my man, and more than my man. She looked into his eyes. You are all of America to me. Let us go, Scripps said. Have you your bird? asked the waitress, laying aside her apron and folding the copy of the Manchester Guardian weekly. I'll bring the Guardian, if you don't mind, she said, wrapping the paper in her apron. It's a new paper, and I've not read it yet. I'm very fond of the Guardian, Scripps said. My family have taken it ever since I can remember. My father was a great admirer of Gladstone. My father went to Eton with Gladstone, the elderly waitress said. And now I am ready. She had donned a coat and stood ready, her apron, her steel-rimmed spectacles in their worn black Morocco case, her copy of the Manchester Guardian, held in her hand. "'Have you no hat?' asked Scripps. "'No. Then I will buy you one,' Scripps said tenderly. "'Will be your wedding gift,' the elderly waitress said. Again there were tears shown in her eyes. "'Now let us go,' Scripps said. The elderly waitress came out from behind the counter, and together— Hand in hand, they strode out into the night. Inside the beanery, the black cook pushed up the wicket and looked through from the kitchen. Day's gone off, he chuckled, gone off into the night. Well, 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 he closed the wicket softly. Even he was a little impressed. Chapter 8 Half an hour later, Scripps O'Neill and the elderly waitress returned to the beanery as man and wife. The beanery looked much the same, there was the long counter, the salt cellars, the sugar containers, the ketchup bottle, the Worcestershire sauce bottle. There was the wicket that led into the kitchen. Behind the counter was the relief waitress. She was a buxom, jolly-looking girl, and she wore a white apron. At the counter, reading a Detroit paper, sat a drummer. The drummer was eating a T-bone steak and hash-brown potatoes. Something very beautiful had happened to Scripps and the elderly waitress. Now they were hungry. They wished to eat. The elderly waitress looking at Scripps. Scripps looking at the elderly waitress. The drummer reading his paper and occasionally putting a little ketchup on his hash brown potatoes. The other waitress, Mandy, back of the counter in her freshly starched white apron. The frost on the windows. The warmth inside. The cold outside. Scripps bird, rather rumpled now, sitting on the counter and preening his feathers. So you've come back, Mandy, the waitress said. The cook said you had gone out into the night. The elderly waitress looked at Mandy. Her eyes brightened, her voice calm and now of a deeper, richer timbre. We are man and wife now, she said kindly. We have just been married. What would you like to eat for supper, Scripps dear? I don't know, Scripps said. He felt vaguely uneasy. Something was stirring within him. Perhaps you have eaten enough of the beans, dear Scripps, the elderly waitress, now his wife, said. The drummer looked up from his paper. Scripps noticed that it was the Detroit News. There was a fine paper. That's a fine paper you are reading, Scripps said to the drummer. It's a good paper, the news, the drummer said. You two on your honeymoon? Yes, Mrs. Scripps said. We are man and wife now. Well, said the drummer, that's a mighty fine thing to be. I'm a married man myself. Are you, said Scripps? My wife left me. It was in Mancelona. Don't let's talk of that any more, Scripps, dear, Mrs. Scripps said. You've told that story so many times. Yes, dear, Scripps agreed. He felt vaguely mistrustful of himself. Something, somewhere, was stirring inside of him. He looked at the waitress called Mandy, standing robust and vigorously lovely in her newly starched white apron. He watched her hands, healthy, calm, capable hands, doing the duties of her waitresshood. Try one of these T-bones with hash brown potatoes, the drummer suggested. They got a nice T-bone here. Would you like one, dear? Scripps asked his wife. 
I'll just take a bowl of milk and crackers, the elderly Mrs. Scripps said. You have whatever you want, dear. Here's your crackers and milk, Diana, Mandy said, placing them on the counter. Do you want a T-bone, sir? Yes, Scripps said. Something stirred again within him. Well done or rare? Rare, please. The waitress turned and called into the wicket. Tea for one. Let it go raw. Thank you, Scripps said. He eyed the waitress Mandy. She had a gift for the picturesque in speech, that girl. It had been that very picturesque quality in her speech that had first drawn him to his present wife, that in her strange background. England, the lake country. Scripps striding through the lake country with Wordsworth, a field of golden daffodils, the wind blowing at Windermere, far off, perhaps, a stag at bay. Ah, uh, that was farther north in Scotland. They were a hardy race, those Scots, deep in their mountain fastnesses, Harry Louder and his pipe, the Highlanders and the Great War. Why had not he, Scripps, been in the war? That was where that chap Yogi Johnson had it on him. The war would have meant much to him, Scripps. Why hadn't he been in it? Why hadn't he heard of it in time? Perhaps he was too old. Look at that old French General Joffre, though. Surely he was a younger man than that old general. General Foch, praying for victory. The French troops kneeling along the Chemin des Dames, praying for victory. The Germans with their gut meat uns. What a mockery. Surely he was no older than that French General Foch. He wondered. Mandy, the waitress, placed his T-bone steak and hash-brown potatoes on the counter before him. As she laid the plate down, just for an instant, her hand touched his. Scripps felt a strange thrill go through him. Life was before him. He was not an old man. Why were there no wars now? Perhaps there were. Men were fighting in China. Chinamen. Chinamen killing one another. What for? Scripps wondered. What was it all about, anyway? Mandy, the buxom waitress, leaned forward. Say, she said, did I ever tell you about the last words of Henry James? Really, dear Mandy, Mrs. Scripps said, you've told that story rather often. Let's hear it, Scripps said. I'm very interested in Henry James. Henry James. Henry James, that chap who had gone away from his own land to live in England among Englishmen. Why had he done it? For what had he left America? Weren't his roots here? His brother William... Boston, pragmatism, Harvard University, old John Harvard with silver buckles on his shoes, Charles Brickley, Eddie Mahan. Where were they now? Well, Mandy began, Henry James became a British subject on his deathbed. At once, as soon as the king heard Henry James had become a British subject, he sent around the highest decoration in his power to bestow the Order of Merit, the O.M., the elderly Mrs. Scripps explained. That was it, the waitress said. Professors Goss and Saintsbury came with the man who brought the decoration. Henry James was lying on his deathbed, and his eyes were shut. There was a single candle on a table beside the bed. The nurse allowed them to come near the bed, and they put the ribbon of the decoration around James' neck, and the decoration lay on the sheet over Henry James' chest. Professors Goss and Saintsbury leaned forward and smoothed the ribbon of the decoration. Henry James never opened his eyes. The nurse told them they all must go out of the room, and they all went out of the room. When they were all gone, Henry James spoke to the nurse. He never opened his eyes. Nurse, Henry James said, put out the candle, nurse, and spare my blushes. Those were the last words he ever spoke. James was quite a writer, Scripps O'Neill said. He was strangely moved by the story. You don't always tell it the same way, dear, Mrs. Scripps remarked to Mandy. There were tears in Mandy's eyes. I feel very strongly about Henry James, she said. What was the matter with James? asked the drummer. Wasn't America good enough for him? Scripps O'Neill was thinking about Mandy, the waitress. What a background she must have, that girl. What a fund of anecdotes. A chap could go far with a woman like that to help him. He stroked a little bird that sat on the lunch counter before him. The bird pecked at his finger. Was the little bird a hawk? A falcon, perhaps, from one of the big Michigan falconries. Was it perhaps a robin, pulling and tugging at the early worm on some green lawn somewhere? He wondered. What do you call your bird? the drummer asked. 
I haven't named him yet. What would you call him? Why not call him Ariel? Manty asked. Or Puck, Mrs. Scripps put in. What's it mean? asked the drummer. It's a character out of Shakespeare, Mandy explained. Oh, give the bird a chance. What would you call him? Scripps turned at the drummer. He ain't a parrot, is he? asked the drummer. If he was a parrot, you could call him Polly. There is a character in the beggar's opera called Polly, Mandy explained. Scripps wondered. Perhaps the bird was a parrot. A parrot strayed from some comfortable home with some old maid, the untilled soil of some New England spinster. Better wait till you see how he turns out, the drummer advised. You got plenty of time to name him. This drummer had sound ideas. He, Scripps, did not even know what sex the bird was, whether he was a boy bird or a girl bird. Wait till you see if he lays eggs, the drummer suggested. Scripps looked into the drummer's eyes. The fellow had voiced his own unspoken thought. You know a thing or two, drummer, he said. Well, the drummer admitted modestly, I ain't drummed all these years for nothing. You're right there, pal, Scripps said. That's a nice bird you got there, brother, the drummer said. You want to hang on to that bird. Scripps knew it. Ah, these drummers know a thing or two. Going up and down over the face of this great America of ours, these drummers kept their eyes open. They were no fools. Listen, the drummer said. He pushed his derby hat off his brow and, leaning forward, spat into the tall brass cuspidor that stood beside his stool. I want to tell you about a pretty beautiful thing that happened to me once in Bay City. Mandy, the waitress, leaned forward. Mrs. Scripps leaned toward the drummer to hear better. The drummer looked apologetically at Scripps and stroked the bird with his forefinger. Tell you about it some other time, brother, he said. Scripps understood. From out of the kitchen, through the wicket in the hall, came a high-pitched haunting laugh. Scripps listened. Could that be the laughter of the Negro? He wondered. Chapter 9 Scripps going slowly to work in the pump factory in the mornings. Mrs. Scripps looking out of the window and watching him go up the street. Not much time for reading The Guardian now. Not much time for reading about English politics. Not much time for worrying about the cabinet crises over there in France. The French were a strange people. Joan of Arc... Eva Le Gallian, Clemenceau, George Carpentier, Sasha Guitry, Ivan Printemp, Grac, Les Fratellinis, Gilbert Seldes, The Dial, The Dial Prize, Marianne Moore, E. E. Cummings, The Enormous Room, Vanity Fair, Frank Crowninshield. What was it all about? Where was it taking her? She had a man now, a man of her own for her own. Could she keep him? Could she hold him for her own? She wondered. Mrs. Scripps, formerly an elderly waitress, now the wife of Scripps O'Neill, with a good job in the pump factory. Diana Scripps. Diana was her own name. It had been her mother's, too. Diana Scripps, looking into the mirror and wondering could she hold him. It was getting to be a question. Why had he ever met Mandy? Would she have the courage to break off going to the restaurant with Scripps to eat? She couldn't do that. He would go alone. She knew that. It was no use trying to pull wool over her own eyes. He would go alone, and he would talk with Mandy. Diana looked into the mirror. Could she hold him? Could she hold him? That thought never left her now. Every night at the restaurant, she couldn't call it a beanery now. That made a lump come into her throat and made her throat feel hard and choky. Every night at the restaurant now, Scripps and Mandy talked together. The girl was trying to take him away. Him, her Scripps, trying to take him away. Take him away. Could she, Diana, hold him? She was no better than a slut, that Mandy. Was that the way to do? Was that the thing to do? Go after another woman's man? Come between man and wife? Break up a home? And all with these interminable literary reminiscences. These endless anecdotes. Scripps was fascinated by Mandy. Diana admitted that to herself. But she might hold him. That was all that mattered now. To hold him. To hold him. Not to let him go. Make him stay. She looked into the mirror. Diana subscribing for the forum. Diana reading The Mentor. Diana reading William Lyon Phelps and Scribner's. Diana walking through the frozen streets of the silent northern town to the public library 
to read the Literary Digest book review. Diana waiting for the postman to come, bringing the bookman. Diana in the snow, waiting for the postman to bring the Saturday review of literature. Diana, bareheaded now, standing in the mounting snowdrifts, waiting for the postman to bring her the New York Times literary section. Was it doing any good? Was it holding him? At first it seemed to be. Diana learned editorials by John Farrar by heart. Scripps brightened, a little of the old light shining in Scripps' eyes now. Then it died. Some little mistake in the wording, some slip in her understanding of a phrase, some divergence in her attitude, made it all ring false. She would go on. She was not beaten. He was her man, and she would hold him. She looked away from the window and slid open the covering of the magazine that lay on her table. It was Harper's Magazine. Harper's Magazine in a new format. Harper's Magazine, completely changed and revised. Perhaps that would do the trick. She wondered. Chapter 10 Spring was coming. Spring was in the air. Author's note. This is the same day on which the story starts, back on page 3. A Chinook wind was blowing. Workmen were coming home from the factory. Scripps's bird singing in his cage. Diana looking out of the open window. Diana watching for her Scripps to come up the street. Could she hold him? Could she hold him? If she couldn't hold him, would he leave her his bird? She had felt lately that she couldn't hold him. In the nights now, when she touched Scripps, he rolled away, not toward her. It was a little sign, but life was made up of little signs. She felt she couldn't hold him. As she looked out at the window, a copy of the Century magazine dropped from her nerveless hand. The Century had a new editor. There were more woodcuts. Glenn Frank had gone to head some great university somewhere. There were more Van Dorans on the magazine. Diana felt that might turn the trick. Happily, she had opened the Century and read all morning. Then the wind, the warm Chinook wind, had started to blow, and she knew Scripps would soon be home. Men were coming down the street in increasing numbers. Was Scripps among them? She did not like to put on her spectacles to look. She wanted Scripps' first glimpse of her to be of her at her best. As she felt him drawing nearer, the confidence she had in the sentry grew fainter. She had so hoped that would give her the something which would hold him. She wasn't sure now. Scripps coming down the street with a crowd of excited workmen, men stirred by the spring, Scripps swinging his lunch bucket, Scripps waving goodbye to the workmen, who trooped one by one into what had formerly been a saloon, Scripps not looking up at the window, Scripps coming up the stairs, Scripps coming nearer, Scripps coming nearer, Scripps here. Good afternoon, dear Scripps, she said. I've been reading a story by Ruth Suckow. Hello, Diana, Scripps answered. He set down his lunch pail. She looked worn and old. He could afford to be polite. What was the story about, Diana? he asked. It was about a little girl in Iowa, Diana said. She moved toward him. It was about people on the land. It reminded me a little of my own lake country. That's so, asked Scripps. In some ways the pump factory had hardened him. His speech had become more clipped, more like these hardy northern workers. But his mind was the same. Would you like me to read a little of it out loud? Diana asked. There are some lovely woodcuts. How about going down to the beanery? Scripps said. As you wish, dear, Diana said. Then her voice broke. I wish, oh, I wish you had never seen that place. She wiped away her tears. Scripps had not even seen them. I'll bring the bird, dear, Diana said. He hasn't been out all day. Together they went down the street to the beanery. They did not walk hand in hand now. They walked like what are called old married people. Mrs. Scripps carried the bird cage. The bird was happy in the warm wind. Men lurching along, drunk with the spring, passed them. Many spoke to Scripps. He was well known and well liked in the town now. Some, as they lurched by, raised their hats to Mrs. Scripps. She responded vaguely. If I can only hold him, she was thinking. If I can only hold him. As they walked along the slushy snow on the narrow sidewalk of the northern town, something began to beat in her head. Perhaps it was the rhythm of their walking together. I can't hold him. I can't hold him. I can't hold him. Scripps took her arm as they crossed the street. When his hand touched her arm, Diana knew it was true. She would never hold him. A group of Indians passed them on the street. 
Were they laughing at her, or was it some tribal jest? Diana didn't know. All she knew was that rhythm that beat into her brain. I can't hold him. I can't hold him. Author's note. For the reader, not the printer. What difference does it make to the printer? Who is the printer, anyway? Gutenberg? The Gutenberg Bible. Caxton. Twelve-point open-face Caslon. The linotype machine. The author is a little boy being sent to look for type lice. The author is a young man being sent for the key to the forms. Ah, they knew a trick or two, these printers. In case the reader is becoming confused, we are now up to where the story opened with Yogi Johnson and Scripps O'Neill in the pump factory itself, with the Chinook wind blowing. As you see, Scripps O'Neill has now come out of the pump factory and is on his way to the beanery with his wife, who is afraid she cannot hold him. Personally, we don't believe she can, but the reader will see for himself. We will now leave the couple on their way to the beanery and go back and take up Yogi Johnson. We want the reader to like Yogi Johnson. The story will move a little faster from now on, in case any of the readers are tiring. We will also try and work in a number of good anecdotes. Would it be any violation of confidence if we told the reader that we get the best of these anecdotes from Mr. Ford Maddox Ford? We owe him our thanks, and we hope the reader does too. At any rate, we will now go on with Yogi Johnson. Yogi Johnson, the reader may remember, is the chap who is in the war. As the story opens, he is just coming out of the pump factory. See page 3. It is very hard to write this way, beginning things backward, and the author hopes the reader will realize this and not grudge this little word of explanation. I know I would be very glad to read anything the reader ever wrote, and I hope the reader will make the same sort of allowances. If any of the readers would care to send me anything they ever wrote, for criticism or advice, I am always at the Café du Dôme, any afternoon, talking about art with Harold Stearns and Sinclair Lewis, and the reader can bring his stuff along with him, or he can send it to me care of my bank, if I have a bank. Now, if the reader is ready, and understand I don't want to rush the reader any, we will go back to Yogi Johnson, but please remember that while we have gone back to Yogi Johnson, Scripps O'Neill and his wife are on their way to the beanery. What will happen to them there, I don't know. I only wish the reader could help. Part 3. Men and War and the Death of Society It may be likewise noted that affectation does not imply an absolute negation of those qualities which are affected, and therefore, though when it proceeds from hypocrisy, it be nearly allied to deceit. Yet when it comes from vanity only, it partakes of the nature of ostentation. For instance, the affectation of liberality in a vain man differs visibly from the same affectation in the avaricious, for though the vain man is not what he would appear, or hath not the virtue he affects, to the degree he would be thought to have it, yet it sits less awkwardly on him than on the avaricious man, who is the very reverse of what he would seem to be. Henry Fielding Chapter 11 Yogi Johnson walked out of the workman's entrance of the pump factory and down the street. Spring was in the air. The snow was melting, and the gutters were running with snow water. Yogi Johnson walked down the middle of the street, keeping on the as-yet-unmelted ice, he turned to the left and crossed the bridge over Bear River. The ice had already melted into the river, and he watched the swirling brown current. Below, beside the stream, buds on the willow brush were coming out green. It's a real Chinook wind, Yogi thought. The foreman did right to let the men go. It wouldn't be safe keeping them in a day like this. Anything might happen. The owner of the factory knew a thing or two. When the Chinook blew, the thing to do was to get the men out of the factory. Then, if any of them were injured, it was not on him. He didn't get caught under the Employer's Liability Act. They knew a thing or two, these big pump manufacturers. They were smart, all right. Yogi was worried. There was something on his mind. It was spring, there was no doubt of that now, and he did not want a woman. He had worried about it a lot lately. There was no question about it. He did not want a woman. He couldn't explain it to himself. He had gone to the public library and 
asked for a book the night before. He looked at the librarian. Did not want her. Somehow she meant nothing to him. At the restaurant where he had a meal ticket, he looked hard at the waitress who brought him his meals. He did not want her either. He passed a group of girls on their way home from high school. He looked carefully at all of them. He did not want a single one. Decidedly, something was wrong. Was he going to pieces? Was this the end? Well, Yogi thought, women are gone, perhaps, though I hope not. But I still have my love of horses. He was walking up the steep hill that leads up from the Bear River, out onto the Charlevoix Road. The road was not really so steep, but it felt steep to Yogi, his legs heavy with the spring. In front of him was a grain and feed store. A team of beautiful horses were hitched in front of the feed store. Yogi went up to them. He wanted to touch them, to reassure himself that there was something left. The nigh horse looked at him as he came near. Yogi put his hand in his pocket for a lump of sugar. He had no sugar. The horse put its ears back and showed its teeth. The other horse jerked his head away. Was this all that his love of horses had brought him? After all, perhaps there was something wrong with these horses. Perhaps they had glanders or spavin. Perhaps something had been caught in the tender frog of their hoof. Perhaps they were lovers. Yogi walked on up the hill and turned to the left onto the Charlevoix Road. He passed the last houses of the outskirts of Petoskey and came out onto the open country road. On his right was a field that stretched a little Traverse Bay, the blue of the bay opening up into the big Lake Michigan. Across the bay, the pine hills behind Harbor Springs. Beyond, where you could not see it, Cross Village, where the Indians lived. Even further beyond, the Straits of Mackinac, with St. Ignace, where a strange and beautiful thing had once happened to Oscar Gardner, who worked beside Yogi in the pump factory. Further beyond, the Sioux, both Canadian and American. There the wilder spirits of Petoskey sometimes went to drink beer. They were happy then, way, way beyond, and in the other direction at the foot of the lake was Chicago, where Scripps O'Neill had started for on that eventful night when his first marriage had become a marriage no longer. Near there, Gary, Indiana, where were the great steel mills? Near there, Hammond, Indiana. Near there, Michigan City, Indiana. Further beyond, there would be Indianapolis, Indiana, where Booth Tarkington lived. He had the wrong dope, that fellow. Further down there would be Cincinnati, Ohio. Beyond that, Vicksburg, Mississippi. Beyond that, Waco, Texas. Ah, there was a grand sweep to this America of ours. Yogi walked across the road and sat down on a pile of logs, where he could look out over the lake. After all, the war was over, and he was still alive. There was a chap in that fellow Anderson's book that the librarian had given him at the library last night. Why hadn't he wanted the librarian anyway? Could it be because he thought she might have false teeth? Could it be something else? Would a little child ever tell her? He didn't know. What was the librarian to him anyway? This chap in the book by Anderson, he had been a soldier too. He had been at the front two years, Anderson said. What was his name? Fred something. This Fred had thoughts dancing in his brain horror. One night in the time of the fighting, he went out on parade. No, it was patrol in no man's land, and saw another man stumbling along in the darkness and shot him. The man pitched forward, dead. It had been the only time Fred consciously killed a man. You don't kill men in war much, the book said. The hell you don't, Yogi thought, if you're two years in the infantry at the front. They just die. Indeed they do, Yogi thought. Anderson said the act was rather hysterical on Fred's part. He and the men with him might have made the fellow surrender. They had all got the jim jams. After it happened, they all ran away together. Where the hell did they run to, Yogi wondered. Paris? Afterward, killing this man haunted Fred. It's got to be sweet and true. That was the way the soldiers thought, Anderson said. The hell it was. This Fred was supposed to have been two years in an infantry regiment at the front. A couple of Indians were passing along the road, grunting to themselves and to each other. Yogi called to them. The Indians came over. Big white chief got chew of tobacco, asked the first Indian. White chief carry liquor, the second Indian asked. 
Yogi handed them a package of peerless and his pocket flask. White chief, heap big medicine, the Indians grunted. Listen, Yogi Johnson said, I am about to address to you a few remarks about the war, a subject on which I feel very deeply. The Indians sat down on the logs. One of the Indians pointed at the sky. Up there get ye Manitou the mighty, he said. The other Indian winked at Yogi. White chief no believe every goddamn thing he hear, he grunted. Listen, Yogi Johnson said, and he told them about the war. War hadn't been that way to Yogi, he told the Indians. War had been to him like football, American football, what they play at the colleges. Carlisle Indian School. Both the Indians nodded. They had been to Carlisle. Yogi had played center at football, and war had been much the same thing. Intensely unpleasant. When you played football and had the ball, you were down with your legs spread out and the ball held out in front of you on the ground. You had to listen for the signal, decode it, make the proper pass. You had to think about it all the time. While your hands were on the ball, the opposing center stood in front of you, and when you passed the ball, he brought his hand up, smash, into your face and grabbed you with the other hand under the chin or under your armpit and tried to pull you forward or shove you back to make a hole he could go through and break up the play. You were supposed to charge forward so hard you banged him out of the play with your body and put you both on the ground. He had all the advantage. It was not what you would call fun. When you had the ball, he had all the advantage. The only good thing was that when he had the ball, you could roughhouse him. In this way, things evened up, and sometimes even a certain tolerance was achieved. Football, like the war, was unpleasant stimulating and exciting after you had attained a certain hardness, and the chief difficulty had been that of remembering the signals. Yogi was thinking about the war, not the army. He meant combat. The army was something different. You could take it and ride with it, or you could buck the tiger and let it smash you. The army was a silly business, but the war was different. Yogi was not haunted by men he had killed. He knew he had killed five men, Probably he had killed more. He didn't believe men you killed haunted you. Not if you had been two years at the front. Most of the men he had known had been excited as hell when they had first killed. The trouble was to keep them from killing too much. It was hard to get prisoners back to the people that wanted them for identification. You sent a man back with two prisoners. Maybe you sent two men back with four prisoners. What happened? The men came back and said the prisoners were knocked out by the barrage. They would give the prisoner a poke in the seat of the pants with a bayonet, and when the prisoner jumped, they would say, You run, you son of a bitch, and let their gun off in the back of his head. They wanted to be sure they had killed. Also, they didn't want to go back through any damn barrage. No, sir, they learned those kind of manners from the Australians. After all, what were those Jerry's? Bunch of goddamn Huns. Huns sounded like a funny word now. All this sweetness and truth. Not if you were in there two years. In the end, they would have softened, got sorry for excesses, and begun to store up good deeds against getting killed themselves. But that was the fourth phase of soldiering, the gentling down. In a good soldier in the war, it went like this. First, you were brave because you didn't think anything could hit you, because you yourself were something special, and you knew that you could never die. Then you found out different. You were really scared then. But if you were a good soldier, you functioned the same as before. Then, after you were wounded and not killed, with new men coming on and going through your old processes, you hardened and became a good hard-boiled soldier. Then came the second crack, which is much worse than the first. And then you began doing good deeds, and being the boy Sir Philip Sidney, and storing up treasures in heaven. At the same time, of course, functioning always the same as before, as if it were a football game. Nobody had any damn business to write about it, though, that didn't at least know about it from hearsay. Literature has too strong an effect on people's minds. Like this American writer, Willa Cather, who wrote a book about the war where all the last part of it was taken from the action in the birth of a nation. An ex-serviceman wrote to her from all over America to tell her how much they liked it. One of the Indians was asleep. He had been chewing tobacco, and his mouth was pursed up in sleep. He was leaning on the other Indian's shoulder. The Indian, who was awake, pointed to the other Indian, who was asleep, and 
shook his head. Well, how did you like the speech? Yogi asked the Indian, who was awake. White chief have heap much sound ideas, the Indian said. White chief educated like hell. Thank you, Yogi said. He felt touched. Here among the simple aborigines, the only real Americans, he had found that true communion. The Indian looked at him, holding the sleeping Indian carefully that his head might not fall back upon the snow-covered logs. Was white chief in the war? the Indian asked. I landed in France in May 1917, Yogi began. I thought maybe white chief was in the war from the way he talked, the Indian said. Him, he raised the head of his sleeping companion up, so the last rays of the sunset shone on the sleeping Indian's face. He got V.C. Me, I got D.S.O. and M.C. with Bar. I was major in the fourth C.M.R.'s. I'm glad to meet you, Yogi said. He felt strangely humiliated. It was growing dark. There was a single line of sunset where the sky and water met way out on Lake Michigan. Yogi watched the narrow line of the sunset grow darker red, thin to a mere slip, and then fade. The sun was down behind the lake. Yogi stood up from the pile of logs. The Indian stood up, too. He awakened his companion, and the Indian, who had been sleeping, stood up and looked at Yogi Johnson. We go to Petoskey to join Salvation Army, the larger and more wakeful Indian said. White chief come, too, said the smaller Indian, who had been asleep. I'll walk in with you, Yogi replied. Who were these Indians? What did they mean to him? With the sun down, the slushy road was stiffening. It was freezing again. After all, maybe spring was not coming. Maybe it did not make a difference that he did not want a woman. Now that the spring was perhaps not coming, there was a question about that. He would walk into town with the Indians and look for a beautiful woman and try and want her. He turned down the now frozen road. The two Indians walked by his side. They were all bound in the same direction. Chapter 12 Through the night, down the frozen road, the three walked into Petoskey. They had been silent, walking along the frozen road. Their shoes broke the new-formed crusts of ice. Sometimes Yogi Johnson stepped through a thin film of ice into a pool of water. The Indians avoided the pools of water. They came down the hill past the feed store, crossed the bridge over the Bear River, their boots ringing hollowly on the frozen planks of the bridge, and climbed the hill that led past Dr. Rumsey's house and the, and the home tea room up to the pool room. In front of the pool room, the two Indians stopped. White chief shoot pool? the big Indian asked. No, Yogi Johnson said. My right arm was crippled in the war. White chief have hard luck, the small Indian said. Shoot one game Kelly pool. He got both arms and both legs shot off at wipers, the big Indian said, and then aside to Yogi, and very sensitive. All right, Yogi Johnson said, I'll shoot one game. They went into the hot, smoke-filled warmth of the pool room. They obtained a table and took down cues from the wall. As the little Indian reached up to take down his cue, Yogi noticed that he had two artificial arms. They were brown leather and were both buckled on at the elbow. On the smooth green cloth, under the bright electric lights, they played pool. At the end of an hour and a half, Yogi Johnson found that he owed the little Indian four dollars and thirty cents. You shoot a pretty nice stick, he remarked to the small Indian. Me not shoot so good since the war, the small Indian replied. White chief like to drink a little, asked the larger Indian. Where do you get it, asked Yogi. I have to go to Sheboygan for mine. White chief come with red brothers, the big Indian said. They left the pool table, placed their cues in the rack on the wall, paid at the counter, and went out into the night. Along the dark streets, men were sneaking home. The frost had come and frozen everything stiff and cold. The Chinook had not been a real Chinook after all. Spring had not yet come, and the men who had commenced their orgies were halted by the chill in the air that told them the Chinook wind had been a fake. That foreman, Yogi thought, he'll catch hell tomorrow. Perhaps it had all been engineered by the pump manufacturers to get the foreman out of his job. Such things were done. Through the dark of the night, men were sneaking home in little groups. The two Indians walked on either side of Yogi. They turned down a side street, 
and all three halted before a building that looked something like a stable. It was a stable. The two Indians opened the door, and Yogi followed them inside. A ladder led upstairs to the floor above. It was dark inside the stable, but one of the Indians lit a match to show Yogi the ladder. The little Indian climbed up first, the metal hinges of his artificial limbs squeaking as he climbed. Yogi followed him, and the other Indian climbed last, lighting Yogi's way with matches. The little Indian knocked on the roof where the ladder stopped against the wall. There was an answering knock. The little Indian knocked an answer, three sharp knocks on the roof above his head. The trap door on the roof was raised, and they climbed up through into the lighted room. In one corner of the room there was a bar with a brass rail and tall spittoons. Behind the bar was a mirror. Easy chairs were all around the room. There was a pool table. Magazines on sticks hung in a line on the wall. There was a framed autograph portrait of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow on the wall, draped in the American flag. Several Indians were sitting in the easy chairs reading. A little group stood at the bar. Nice little club, eh? An Indian came up and shook hands with Yogi. I see you almost every day at the pump factory. It was a man who worked at one of the machines near Yogi in the factory. Another Indian came up and shook hands with Yogi. He also worked in the pump factory. Rotten luck about the Chinook, he said. Yes, Yogi said, just a false alarm. Come and have a drink, the first Indian said. I am with a party, Yogi answered. Who were these Indians, anyway? Bring them along, too, the first Indian said. Always room for one more. Yogi looked around him. The two Indians who had brought him were gone. Where were they? Then he saw them. They were over at the pool table. The tall, refined Indian to whom Yogi was talking followed his glance. He nodded his head in understanding. There are woods Indians, he explained, apologetically. We're most of us town Indians here. Yes, of course, Yogi agreed. The little chap has a very good war record, the tall, refined Indian remarked. The other chap was a major, too, I believe. Yogi was guided over to the bar by the tall, refined Indian. Behind the bar was the bartender. He was a negro. How would some dog's head ale go? asked the Indian. Fine, Yogi said. Two dog's heads, Bruce, the Indian remarked to the bartender. The bartender broke into a chuckle. What are you laughing at, Bruce? the Indian asked. The Negro broke into a shrill, haunting laugh. I knowed it, Massa Red Dog, he said. I knowed you'd order that dog's head all the time. He's a merry fellow, the Indian remarked to Yogi. I must introduce myself. Red Dog's the name. Johnson's the name, Yogi said. Yogi Johnson. Oh, we're all quite familiar with your name, Mr. Johnson. Red Dog smiled. I would like you to meet my friends, Mr. Sitting Bull, Mr. Poison Buffalo, and Chief Running Skunk Backwards. Sitting Bull's a name I know, Yogi remarked, shaking hands. Oh, I'm not one of those Sitting Bulls, Mr. Sitting Bull said. Chief Running Skunk Backwards, great-grandfather once sold the entire island of Manhattan for a few strings of wampum, Red Dog explained. How very interesting, Yogi said. That was a costly bit of wampum for our family. Chief Running Skunk Backwards smiled ruefully. Chief Running Skunk Backwards is some of that wampum. Would you like to see it? Red Dog asked. Indeed, I would. It's really no different from any other wampum. Skunk Backwards explained deprecatingly. He pulled a chain of wampum out of his pocket and handed it to Yogi Johnson. Yogi looked at it curiously. What a part that string of wampum had played in this America of ours. Would you like to have one or two wampums for a keepsake? Skunk backwards asked. I wouldn't like to take your wampum. Yogi demurred. They have no intrinsic value, really, Skunk backwards explained, detaching one or two wampums from the string. Their value is really a sentimental one to Skunk backwards family, Red Dog said. It's damn decent of you. Mr. Skunk Backwards, Yogi said. It's nothing, Skunk Backwards said. You'd do the same for me in a moment. It's decent of you. Behind the bar, Bruce, the Negro bartender, had been leaning forward and watching the wampums pass from hand to hand. His dark face shone. Sharply, without explanation, he broke into high-pitched, uncontrolled laughter, the dark laughter of the Negro. Red Dog looked at him sharply. I say, Bruce, he spoke sharply, 
your mirth is a little ill-timed. Bruce stopped laughing and wiped his face on a towel. He rolled his eyes apologetically. I can't help it, Master Red Dog. When I seen Mr. Skunk Backhouse passing dim wampums around, I just couldn't stand it no longer. What do you want to sell a big town like New York for dim wampums for? Wampums? Take away your wampums. Bruce is an eccentric, Red Dog explained, but he's a corking bartender and a good-hearted chap. You're right there, Massa Red Dog, the bartender leaned forward. I's got a heart of pure gold. He is an eccentric, though, Red Dog apologized. The House Committee are always after me to get another bartender, but I like the chap, oddly enough. I'm all right, boss, Bruce said. It's just that when I see something funny, I just have to laugh. You know, I don't mean no harm, boss. Right enough, Bruce, Red Dog agreed. You are an honest chap. Yogi Johnson looked about the room. The other Indians had gone away from the bar, and Skunk Backwards was showing the wampum to a little group of Indians in dinner dress who had just come in. At the pool table, the two woods Indians were still playing. They had removed their coats, and the light above the pool table glinted on the metal joints in the little woods Indian's artificial arms. He had just run the table for the eleventh consecutive time. That little chap would have made a pool player if he hadn't had a bit of hard luck in the war, Red Dog remarked. Would you like to have a look about the club? He took the check from Bruce, signed it, and Yogi followed him into the next room. Our committee room, Red Dog said. On the walls were framed autographed photographs of Chief Bender, Francis Parkman, D. H. Lawrence, Chief Myers, Stuart Edward White, Mary Austin, Jim Thorpe, General Custer, Glenn Warner, Mabel Dodge, and a full-length oil painting of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Beyond the committee room was a locker room with a small plunge bath or swimming pool. It's really ridiculously small for a club, Red Dog said, but it makes a comfortable little hole to pop into when the evenings are dull. He smiled. We call it the wigwam, you know. That's a little conceit of my own. It's a damn nice club, Yogi said, enthusiastically. Put you up if you like, Red Dog offered. What's your tribe? What do you mean? Your tribe? What are you? Sack and Fox? Jibway? Cree, I imagine? Oh, said Yogi, my parents come from Sweden. Red Dog looked at him closely. His eyes narrowed. You're not having me on. No, they either came from Sweden or Norway, Yogi said. I'd have sworn you looked a bit on the white side, Red Dog said. Damn good thing this came out in time. There'd have been no end of scandal. He put his hand to his head and pursed his lips. Here, you, he turned suddenly and gripped Yogi by the vest. Yogi felt the barrel of an automatic pushed hard against his stomach. You'll go quietly through the club room, get your coat and hat, and leave as though nothing had happened. Say polite goodbye to anyone who happens to speak to you, and never come back. Get that, you Swede? Yes, said Yogi. Put up your gun. I'm not afraid of your gun. Do as I say, Red Dog ordered. As for those two pool players who brought you here, I'll soon have them out of this. Yogi went into the bright room, looked at the bar where Bruce, the bartender, was regarding him, got his hat and coat, said good night to Skunk Backwards, who asked him why he was leaving so early, and the outside trap door was swung up by Bruce. As Yogi started down the ladder, the Negro burst out laughing. I noted, he laughed. I noted all the time. No Swede gonna fool old Bruce. Yogi looked back and saw the laughing black face of the negro, framed in the oblong square of light that came through the raised trap door. Once on the stable floor, Yogi looked around him. He was alone. The straw of the old stable was stiff and frozen under his feet. Where had he been? Had he been in an Indian club? What was it all about? Was this the end? Above him, a slit of light came in the roof. Then it was blocked by two black figures. There was the sound of a kick, a blow, a series of thuds, some dull, some sharp, and two human forms came crashing down the ladder. From above floated the dark, haunting sound of black negro laughter. The two woods Indians picked themselves up from the straw and limped toward the door. One of them, the little one, was crying. Yogi followed them out into the cold night. It was cold, the night was clear, the stars were out. Club no damn good, the big Indian said. Club heap no damn good. The little Indian was crying. 
Yogi in the starlight saw that he had lost one of his artificial arms. Me no play pool no more, the little Indian sobbed. He shook his one arm at the window of the club, from which a thin slit of light came. Club heap goddamn hell no good. Never mind, Yogi said, I'll get you a job in the pump factory. Pump factory hell, the big Indian said. We all go join Salvation Army. Don't cry, Yogi said to the little Indian. I'll buy you a new arm. The little Indian went on crying. He sat down in the snowy road. No can play pool, me no care about nothing, he said. From above them, out of the window of the club, came the haunting sound of a negro laughing. Author's Note to the Reader In case it may have any historical value, I am glad to state that I wrote the foregoing chapter in two hours directly on the typewriter, and then went out to lunch with John Dos Passos, whom I consider a very forceful writer, and an exceedingly pleasant fellow besides. This is what is known in the provinces as log-rolling. We lunched on rolled mops, salt munier, civet du yefa à la chaise cocotte, marmalade de pomme, and washed it all down, as we used to say, eh, reader, with a bottle of Monrachet, 1919, with the sole, and a bottle of Hospice du Bonia, 1919, a piece with a jugged hair. Mr. Dos Passos, I believe, shared a bottle of Chambartin with me over the marmalade du pommes. English applesauce. We drank two vieux marks, and after deciding not to go to the Café du Dom and talk about art, we both went to our respective homes and I wrote the following chapter. I would like the reader to particularly remark the way the complicated threads of the lives of the various characters in the book are gathered together and then held there in that memorable scene in the beanery. It was when I read this chapter aloud to him that Mr. Dos Passos exclaimed, Hemingway, you have wrought a masterpiece. P.S. From the author to the reader. It is at this point, reader, that I am going to try and get that sweep and movement into the book that shows that the book is really a great book. I know you hope just as much as I do, reader, that I will get this sweep and movement, because think what it will mean to both of us. Mr. H. G. Wells, who has been visiting at our home, we're getting along in the litter again, eh, reader? Asked us the other day if perhaps our reader, that's you, reader, just think of it, H. G. Wells talking about you right in our home. Anyway, H. G. Wells asked us if perhaps our reader would not think too much of this story was autobiographical. Please, reader, just get that idea out of your head. We have lived in Petoskey, Michigan, it is true, and naturally many of the characters are drawn from life as we lived it then. But they are other people, not the author. The author only comes into the story in these little notes. It is true that before starting the story, we spent twelve years studying the various Indian dialects of the North, and there is still preserved in the museum at Cross Village our translation of the New Testament into Ojibwe. But you would have done the same thing in our place, reader, and I think if you think it over, you will agree with us on this. Now, to get back to the story. It is meant in the best spirit of friendship when I say that you have no idea, reader, what a hard chapter this is going to be to write. As a matter of fact, and I try to be frank about these things, we will not even try and write it until tomorrow. Part 4. The Passing of a Great Race and the Making and Marring of Americans Chapter 13 through 16 An Author's Final Note to the Reader but perhaps it may be objected to me that I have against my own rules introduced vices, and of a very black kind, into this work, to which I shall answer, first, that it is very difficult to pursue a series of human actions and keep clear from them, secondly, that the vices to be found here are rather the accidental consequences of some human frailty or a foible than causes habitually existing in the mind. Thirdly, that they are never set forth as the objects of ridicule, but detestation. Fourthly, that they are never the principal figure at that time on the scene. And lastly, they never produce the intended evil. Henry Fielding Chapter 13 Yogi Johnson, walking down the silent street with his arm around the little Indian's shoulder, 
the big Indian walking along beside them, the cold night, the shuttered houses of the town, the little Indian who has lost his artificial arm, the big Indian who is also in the war, Yogi Johnson, who is in the war too, the three of them walking, walking, walking. Where were they going? Where could they go? What was there left? Suddenly, under a street light that swung on its drooping wire above a street corner, casting its light down on the snow, the big Indian stopped. Walking no get us nowhere, he grunted. Walking no good. Let wife chief speak. Where we go, white chief? Yogi Johnson did not know. Obviously, walking was not the solution of their problem. Walking was all right in its way. Coxey's army, a horde of men seeking work, pressing on toward Washington. Marching men, Yogi thought, marching on and on, and where were they getting? Nowhere. Yogi knew it only too well. Nowhere. No damn where at all. White chief, speak up, the big Indian said. I don't know, Yogi said. I don't know at all. Was this what they had fought the war for? Was this what it was all about? It looked like it. Yogi standing under the street light. Yogi thinking and wondering. The two Indians in their Mackinac coats. One of the Indians with an empty sleeve. All of them wondering. White chief no speak? The big Indian asked. No. What could Yogi say? What was there to say? Red brother speak? asked the Indian. Speak out, Yogi said. He looked down at the snow. One man's as good as another now. White chief ever go to Brown's beanery? asked the big Indian, looking into Yogi's face under the arc leg. No. Yogi fell all in. Was this the end? A beanery? Well, a beanery as well as any other place, but a beanery? Well, why not? These Indians knew the town. They were ex-servicemen. They both had splendid war records. He knew that himself. But a beanery? White chief come with red brothers. The tall Indian put his arm under Yogi's arm. The little Indian fell into step, forward to the beanery. Yogi spoke quietly. He was a white man, but he knew when he had enough. After all, the white race might not always be supreme. This Moslem revolt, unrest in the east, trouble in the west, Things looked black in the south. Now this condition of things in the north. Where was it taking him? Where did it all lead? Would it help him to want a woman? Would spring ever come? Was it worthwhile after all? He wondered. The three of them striding along the frozen streets of Petoskey, going somewhere now, en route. Hoisman wrote that. It would be interesting to read French. He must try it sometime. There was a street in Paris named after Hoisman's, right around the corner from where Gertrude Stein lived. Ah, uh, there was a woman. Where were her experiments and words bleeding her? What was at the bottom of it? All that in Paris. Ah, uh, Paris. How far was it to Paris now? Paris in the morning. Paris in the evening. Paris at night. Paris in the morning again. Paris at noon, perhaps. Why not? Yogi Johnson striding on his mind never still. All three of them striding on together, the arms of those that had arms linked through each other's arms, red men and white men walking together. Something had brought them together. Was it the war? Was it fate? Was it accident? Or was it just chance? These questions struggled with each other in Yogi Johnson's brain. His brain was tired. He had been thinking too much lately. On still they strode. Then abruptly they stopped. The little Indian looked up at the sign. It shone in the night outside the frosted windows of the beanery. Best by test. Make em heap big test, the little Indian grunted. White man's beanery got heap fine T-bone steak, the tall Indian grunted. Take it from Red Brother. The Indian stood a little uncertainly outside the door. The tall Indian turned to Yogi. White chief got dollars? Yes, I've got money, Yogi answered. He was prepared to go the route. It was no time to turn back now. The feed's on me, boys. White chief nature's nobleman, the tall Indian grunted. White chief rough diamond, the little Indian agreed. You'd do the same for me, Yogi deprecated. After all, perhaps it was true. It was a chance he was taking. 
He had taken a chance in Paris once. Steve Brody had taken a chance, or so they said. Chances were taken all over the world every day. In China, Chinamen were taking chances. In Africa, Africans. In Egypt, Egyptians. In Poland, Poles. In Russia, Russians. In Ireland, Irish. In Armenia. Armenians no take chances, the tall Indian grunted quietly. He had voiced Yogi's unspoken doubt. They were a canny folk, these red men. Not even in the rug game? Red brother, think not, the Indian said. His tones carried conviction to Yogi. Who were these Indians? There was something back of all of this. They went into the beanery. Author's note to reader. It was at this point in the story, reader, that Mr. F. Scott Fitzgerald came to our home one afternoon, and after remaining for quite a while, suddenly sat down in the fireplace and would not, or was it could not, reader, get up and let the fire burn something else so as to keep the room warm. I know, reader, that these things sometimes do not show in the story, but just the same, they are happening, and think what they mean to chaps like you and me in the literary game. Few should think this part of the story is not as good as it might have been. Remember, reader, that day in and day out all over the world things like this are happening. Need I add, reader, that I have the utmost respect for Mr. Fitzgerald, and let anybody else attack him, and I would be the first to spring to his defense. And that includes you too, reader, though I hate to speak out bluntly like this, and take the risk of breaking up a friendship of the sort that ours has gotten to be. P.S. to the reader. As I read that chapter over, reader, it doesn't seem so bad. You may like it. I hope you will. And if you do like it, reader, and the rest of the book as well, will you tell your friends about it, and try and get them to buy the book just as you have done? I only get twenty cents on each book that is sold, and while twenty cents is not much nowadays, still it will mount up to a lot if two or three hundred thousand copies of the book are sold. They will be, too, if everyone likes the book as much as you and I do, reader. And listen, reader, I meant it when I said I would be glad to read anything you wrote. That wasn't just talk. Bring it along and we will go over it together. If you like, I'll rewrite bits of it for you. I don't mean that in any critical sort of way, either. If there is anything you do not like in this book, just write to Mr. Scribner's sons at the home office. They'll change it for you. Or, if you would rather, I will change it myself. You know what I think of you, reader, and you're not angry or upset about what I said about Scott Fitzgerald, either are you? I hope not. Now I'm going to write the next chapter. Mr. Fitzgerald is gone, and Mr. Dos Passos had gone to England, and I think I can promise you that it will be a bully chapter. At least it will be just as good as I can write it. We both know how good that can be, if we read the blurbs. Eh, reader? Chapter 14. Inside the Beanery. They're all inside the beanery. Some do not see the others. Each are intent on themselves. Red men are intent on red men. White men are intent on white men or on white women. There are no red women. Are there no squaws any more? What has become of the squaws? Have we lost our squaws in America? Silently, through the door which she had opened, a squaw came into the room. She was clad only in a pair of worn moccasins. On her back was a papoose. Beside her walked a husky dog. Don't look the drummer shouted to the woman at the counter. Here, get her out of here, the owner of the beanery shouted. The squaw was forcibly ejected by the negro cook. They heard her thrashing around in the snow outside. Her husky dog was barking. My God, what might that have led to? Scripps O'Neill mopped his forehead with a napkin. The Indians had watched with impassive faces. Yogi Johnson had been unable to move. The waitresses had covered their faces with napkins or whatever was handy. Mrs. Scripps had covered her eyes with the American mercury. Scripps O'Neill was feeling faint and shaken. Something had stirred inside him, some vague primordial feeling, as the squaw had come into the room. "'Wonder where that squaw came from?' the drummer asked. "'Her my squaw,' the little Indian said. "'Good God, man, can't you clothe her?' Scripps O'Neill said in a dumb voice. There was a note of terror in his words. "'Her no light clothes,' the little Indian explained." her woods Indian. Yogi Johnson was not listening. Something had broken inside of him. Something had snapped as the squaw came into the room. He had a new feeling. 
a feeling he thought had been lost forever, lost for always. Lost, gone permanently, he knew now it was a mistake. He was all right now. By the merest chance he had found it out. What might he not have thought if that squaw had never come into the beanery? What black thoughts he had been thinking. He had been on the verge of suicide, self-destruction, killing himself, here in this beanery. What a mistake that would have been. He knew now what a botch he might have made of life, killing himself. Let spring come now. Let it come. It couldn't come fast enough. Let spring come. He was ready for it. Listen, he said to the two Indians, I want to tell you about something that happened to me in Paris. The two Indians leaned forward. White Chief got the floor, the tall Indian remarked. What I thought was a very beautiful thing happened to me in Paris, Yogi began. You Indians know Paris? Good. Well, it turned out to be the ugliest thing that ever happened to me. The Indians grunted. They knew their Paris. It was the first day of my leave. I was walking along the boulevard Malherbes. A car passed me, and a beautiful woman leaned out. She called to me, and I came. She took me to a house, a mansion, rather, in a distant part of Paris. And there a very beautiful thing happened to me. Afterwards, someone took me out a different door than I had come in by. The beautiful woman had told me that she would never, that she could never, see me again. I tried to get the number of the mansion, but it was one of a block of mansions, all looking the same. From then on, all through my leave, I tried to see that beautiful lady. Once I thought I saw her in the theater. It wasn't her. Another time I caught a glimpse of what I thought was her in a passing taxi, and leaped into another taxi and followed. I lost the taxi. I was desperate. Finally, on the next to the last night of my leave, I was so desperate and dull that I went with one of those guides that guaranteed to show you all of Paris. We started out and visited various places. Is this all you've got? I asked the guide. There is a real place, but it's very expensive, the guide said. We compromised on a price finally. And the guide took me. It was in an old mansion. You looked through a slit in the wall. All around the wall were people looking through slits. There, looking through slits, could be seen the uniforms of men of all the Allied countries, and many handsome South Americans in evening dress. I looked through a slit myself. For a while nothing happened. Then a beautiful woman came into the room with a fine British officer. She took off her long fur coat and her hat and threw them into a chair. The officer was taking off his Sam Brown belt. I recognized her. It was the lady whom I had been with when that beautiful thing happened to me. Yogi Johnson looked at his empty plate of beans. Since then, he said, I have never wanted a woman. How I have suffered, I cannot tell. But I have suffered, boys. I have suffered. I blamed it on the war. I blamed it on France. I blamed it on the decay of morality in general. I blamed it on the younger generation. I blamed it here. I blamed it there. Now I am cured. Here's five dollars for you, boys. His eyes were shining. Get more to eat. Take a trip somewhere. This is the happiest day of my life. He stood up from the stool before the counter, shook the one Indian impulsively by the hand, rested his hand for a minute on the other Indian's shoulder, opened the door of the beanery, and strode out into the night. The two Indians looked at one another. White chief, heap nice fellow, observed the big Indian. Think him was in the war? asked the little Indian. Me wonder, the big Indian said. White Chief said he'd buy me new artificial arm. The little Indian grumbled. Maybe you get more than that, the big Indian said. Me wonder, the little Indian said. They went on eating. The other end of the counter of the beanery, a marriage was coming to an end. Scripps O'Neill and his wife sat side by side. Mrs. Scripps knew now. She couldn't hold him. She had tried and failed. She had lost. She knew it was a losing game. There was no holding him now. Mandy was talking again, talking, talking, always talking, that interminable stream of literary gossip that was bringing her, Diana's, marriage to an end. She couldn't hold him. He was going, going, going away from her. Diana sitting there in misery, Scripps listening to Mandy talking, Mandy talking, 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 the drummer, an old friend now, the, the drummer, sitting, reading his Detroit news. She couldn't hold him. She couldn't hold him. She couldn't hold him. The little Indian got up from his stool at the beanery counter and went over to the window. 
The glass on the window was covered with thick, rimy frost. The little Indian breathed on the frozen window pane, rubbed the spot bare with the empty sleeve of his Mackinaw coat, and looked out into the night. Suddenly he turned from the window and rushed out into the night. The tall Indian watched him go, leisurely finished his meal, took a toothpick, placed it between his teeth, and then he too followed his friend out into the night. Chapter 15 They were alone in the beanery now, Scripps and Mandy and Diana. Only the drummer was with them. He was an old friend now, but his nerves were on edge tonight. He folded his paper abruptly and started for the door. See you all later, he said. He went out into the night. It seemed the only thing to do. He did it. Only three of them in the beanery now, Scripps and Mandy and Diana, only those three. Mandy was talking, leaning on the counter and talking, Scripps with his eyes fixed on Mandy, Diana making no pretense of listening now. She knew it was over. It was all over now, but she would make one more attempt, one more last gallant try. Perhaps she still could hold him. Perhaps it had been all just a dream. She steadied her voice, and then she spoke. Scripps, dear, she said. Her voice shook a little. She steadied it. What's on your mind? Scripps asked abruptly. Ah, oh, there it was, that horrid clip speech again. Scripps, dear, wouldn't you like to come home? Diana's voice quavered. There's a new Mercury. She had changed from the London Mercury to the American Mercury, just to please Scripps. It just came. I wish you felt like coming home, Scripps. There is a splendid thing in this Mercury. Do come home, Scripps. I've never asked anything of you before. Come home, Scripps. Oh, won't you come home? Scripps looked up. Diana's heart beat faster. Perhaps he was coming. Perhaps she was holding him. Holding him. Holding him. Do come, Scripps, dear, Diana said softly. There's a wonderful editorial in it by Mencken, about chiropractors. Scripps looked away. Won't you come, Scripps? Diana pleaded. No, Scripps said. I don't give a damn about Mencken anymore. Diana dropped her head. Oh, Scripps, she said. Oh, Scripps. This was the end. She had her answer now. She'd lost him. Lost him. Lost him. It was over. Finished. Done for. She sat crying silently. Mandy was talking again. Suddenly Diana straightened up. She had one last request to make. One thing she would ask of him. Only one. He might refuse her. He might not grant it. But she would ask him. Scripps, she said. What's the trouble? Scripps turned in irritation. Perhaps after all he was sorry for her. He wondered. Can I take the bird, Scripps? Diana's voice broke. Sure, said Scripps. Why not? Diana picked up the bird cage. The bird was asleep perched on one leg as on that night when they had first met. What was it he was like? Ah, yes, like an old osprey. An old, old osprey from her own lake country. She held the cage to her tightly. Thank you, Scripps, she said. Thank you for this bird. Her voice broke. And now I must be going. Quietly, silently, gathering her shawl around her, clutching the cage with the sleeping bird, and the copy of the Mercury to her breast, with only a backward glance, a last glance at him who had been her scripts. She opened the door of the beanery and went out into the night. Scripps did not even see her go. He was intent on what Mandy was saying. Mandy was talking again. That bird she just took out, Mandy was saying. Oh, did she take a bird out? Scripps asked. Go on with the story. You used to wonder what sort of bird that was, Mandy went on. That's right, Scripps agreed. Well, that reminds me of a story about Goss and the Marquis of Buke, Mandy went on. Tell it, Mandy, tell it, Scripps urged her. It seems a great friend of mine, Ford, you've heard me speak of him before, was in the Marquis's castle during the war. His regiment was billeted there, and the Marquis, one of the richest, if not the richest man in England, was serving in Ford's regiment as a private. Ford was sitting in the library one evening. The library was a most extraordinary place. The walls were made of bricks of gold set into tiles or something. I forget exactly how it was. Go on, Scripps urged. It doesn't matter. Anyhow, in the middle of the wall of the library was a stuffed flamingo in a glass case. 
They understand interior decorating, these English, Scripps said. Your wife was English, wasn't she? asked Mandy. From the lake country, Scripps answered. Go on with the story. Well, anyway, Mandy went on. Ford was sitting there in the library one evening after mess, when the butler came in and said the Marquis of Buke's compliments, and might he show the library to a group of friends with whom he has been dining. They used to let him dine out, and sometimes they let him sleep in the castle. Ford said, quite. And in came the Marquis in his private's uniform, followed by Sir Edmund Goss and Professor What's-His-Name. I forget it for the moment. From Oxford. Goss stopped in front of the stuffed flamingo in the glass case and said, What have we here, Buke? It's a flamingo, Sir Edmund, the Marquis answered. That's not my idea of a flamingo, Goss remarked. No, Goss, that's God's idea of a flamingo, Professor What's-His-Name said. I wish I could remember his name. Don't bother, Scripps said. His eyes were bright. He leaned forward. Something was pounding inside of him, something he could not control. I love you, Mad, he said. I love you. You are my woman. The thing was pounding away inside of him. It would not stop. That's all right, Mandy answered. I've known you were my man for a long time. Would you like to hear another story? Speaking of woman. Go on, Scripps said. You must never stop, Mandy. You are my woman now. Sure, Mandy agreed. This story is about when Newt Hampson was a streetcar conductor in Chicago. Go on, Scripps said. You are my woman now, Mandy. He repeated the phrase to himself. My woman. My woman. You are my woman. She is my woman. It is my woman. My woman. But somehow he was not satisfied. Somewhere, somehow, there must be something else. Something else. My woman. The words were a little hollow now. Into his mind, though, he tried to thrust it out. There came again the monstrous picture of the squaw as she strode silently into the room. That squaw. She did not wear clothes because she did not like them. Hardy, braving the winter nights. What might not the spring bring? Mandy was talking. Mandy talking on in the beanery. Mandy telling her stories. It grows late in the beanery. Mandy talks on. She is his woman now. He is her man. But is he her man? In Scripps' brain, that vision of the squaw, the squaw that strode unannounced into the beanery, the squaw who had been thrown out into the snow, Mandy talking on, telling literary reminiscences, authentic incidents. They had the ring of truth, but were they enough? Scripps wondered. She was his woman, but for how long? Scripps wondered. Mandy talking on in the beanery, Scripps listening. But his mind straying away, straying away, straying away. Where was it straying? Out into the night. Out into the night. Chapter 16 Night in Petoskey. Long past midnight. Inside the beanery a light burning. The town asleep under the northern moon. To the north the tracks of the G.R. and I railroad running far into the north. Cold tracks stretching north toward Mackinac City and St. Ignace. Cold tracks to be walking on at this time of night. North of the frozen little northern town, a couple walking side by side on the tracks. It is Yogi Johnson walking with the squaw. As they walk, Yogi Johnson silently strips off his garments. One by one, he strips off his garments and casts them beside the track. In the end, he is clad only in a worn pair of pump maker's shoes. Yoki Johnson, naked in the moonlight, walking north beside the squaw. The squaw, striding along beside him. She carries the papoose on her back in his bark cradle. Yogi attempts to take the papoose from her. He would carry the papoose. The husky dog whines and licks at Yogi Johnson's ankles. No, the squaw would carry the papoose herself. On they stride, into the north, into the northern light. Behind them come two figures, sharply etched in the moonlight. It is the two Indians, the two woods Indians. They stoop and gather up the garments Yogi Johnson has cast away. Occasionally they grunt to one another, striding softly along in the moonlight. Their keen eyes do not miss a single cast-off garment. When the last garment has been cast off, they look and see far ahead of them the two figures in the moonlight. The two Indians straighten up. They examine the garments. 
White Chief Snappy Dresser, the tall Indian remarks, holding up an initialed shirt. White Chief go and get pretty cold, small Indian remarks. He hands a vest to the tall Indian. The tall Indian rolls all the clothing, all the cast-off garments, into a bundle, and they start back along the tracks to the town. Better keep clothes for White Chief, or sell em Salvation Army, asks the short Indian. Better sell em Salvation Army, the tall Indian grunts. White Chief maybe never come back. White Chief come back all right, grunted the little Indian. Better sell em Salvation Army, anyway, grunts the tall Indian. White Chief need new clothes, anyhow, when spring comes. They walked down the tracks toward town. The air seemed to soften. The Indians walked uneasily now. Through the tamaracks and cedars beside the railway tracks, a warm wind is blowing. The snowdrifts are melting now, beside the tracks. Something stirs inside the two Indians, some urge, some strange pagan disturbance. The warm wind is blowing. The tall Indian stops. Moistens his finger and holds it up in the air. The little Indian watches. Chinook, he asks. Heap Chinook, the tall Indian says. They hurry on toward town. The moon is blurred now by clouds carried by the warm Chinook wind that is blowing. Want to get in town before rush, the tall Indian grunts. Red brothers want be well up in line, the little Indian grunts anxiously. Nobody work in factory now, the tall Indian grunted. Better hurry. The warm wind blows. Inside the Indians, strange longings were stirring. They knew what they wanted. Spring at last was coming to the frozen little northern town. The two Indians hurried along the track. The End Author's Final Note to the Reader Well, reader, how did you like it? It took me ten days to write it. Has it been worth it? There's just one place I would like to clear up. You remember back in the story where the elderly waitress, Diana, tells about how she lost her mother in Paris and woke up to find herself with a French general in the next room? I thought perhaps you might be interested to know the real explanation of that. What actually happened was that her mother was taken violently ill with a bubonic plague in the night, and the doctor who was called diagnosed the case and warned the authorities. It was the day the great exposition was to be opened and think what a case of bubonic plague would have done for the exposition as publicity. So the French authorities simply had the woman disappear. She died toward morning. The general, who was summoned and who then got into bed in the same room where the mother had been, always seemed to us like a pretty brave man. He was one of the big stockholders in the exposition, though, I believe. Anyway, reader, as a piece of secret history, it always seemed to me like an awfully good story. And I know you would rather have me explain it here than drag an explanation into the novel, where really, after all, it has no place. It is interesting to observe, though, how the French police hushed the whole matter up, and how quickly they got a hold of the coiffure and the cab driver. Of course, what it shows is that when you're traveling abroad alone, or even with your mother, you simply cannot be too careful. I hope it is all right about bringing this in here, but I just felt I owed it to you, reader to give some explanation. I do not believe in these protracted goodbyes any more than I do in long engagements, so I'll just say a simple farewell and Godspeed, reader, and leave you now to your own devices. End of Part 4